Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very last lecture of this series for my ANLI 520 course. We're going to finish out our sentiment analytics section, complete with puppy dog noises, because I have two wild beagles. <laughs> so you may hear them running around in the background, but they'll keep it light and entertaining while we talk about how to measure emotion. It's Zoom hour here, but sometimes you just got to get this stuff done. So to remind you about what we did before, surely we can do better than 70% correct. So we worked with text blob, AFIN, Vader, uh, Cinti WordNet, and we could only really get about 70 or maybe a little more for text blob. It was our best one. They agree. So lexicon-based models in an unsupervised style are really great when you're approaching a new task and you want a quick answer. And it's also well-defined for most regular English in this case, because all of those are English. But as long as you have a word list with polarity ratings, you can do that in any language. There are a ton, and I do mean a ton, of polarity data sets that are marked with things like the A new data set that is um, in many languages at this point. So it is a flexible system that will allow you to work with data with no machine learning knowledge necessary, just a little bit of coding knowledge. So that's great when you are approaching a new task and you want an answer or you want something quick. They're also very efficient. Okay, step into WordNet, that one's kind of slow. Training your own model could allow you to create a better classifier. Machine learning models are great. They can really help us tune those parameters to make better judgments. And they may capture something that we aren't capturing by looking at each individual word by itself. So for example, sarcasm, irony, context, very hard to capture. Uh, maybe with something like WordNet, we could grab those components, but we'll see today whether or not those things are useful. So for the feature extraction, because any good machine learning model, like we learned in our classification lecture, first starts with some sort of set of features to predict that outcome. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use one of the techniques that we learned in that classification section to train and classify a sentiment model ourselves. <clears throat> wow, dogs. So let's do the simplest ones, which is the bag of words method because not only is it simple, it's, it's effective. It works just like we saw in our last lecture set. And then we'll also test a TF-IDF normalization on our bag of words method. So remember, I don't like when people call TF-IDF a method because it's literally math applied to the bag of words technique, right? So it is a way to sort of smooth out the sparsity of the matrix. So we're going to import count vectorizer and TF-IDF vectorizer. I do love that scikit-learn has a very consistent system, much for the same reason I love Gensum. Um, I do want to remind you that the people have arguments over if they're doing the appropriate math for the TF-IDF normalization. All right, so we'll do count vectorizer. We won't make this a one-hot matrix because we expect some words to be used many times, like not. It can occur a minimum of, you know, at least once by setting the minimum frequency to zero. Uh, don't cut off the top because we've already eliminated stop words, except no and not and but from our list um, when we did data cleaning earlier in this lecture. And in this case, we're going to use one and two grams. So we're going to work with unigrams and bigram counts. That'll help maybe capture some of that context. We use fit transform on our training data set that we created earlier and um, just transform on the review data set. Quick reminder that fit transform creates the vocabulary and then applies that to all the documents. Transform takes that same vocabulary and applies it to the new documents because you can't have words that you've never seen before in the testing data set because it doesn't know what to do to predict with them. Same thing for TF IDF. And so we're using all the same parameters, just apply the normalization component to it. Now, we have to use some sort of math. 
So the first step, feature extraction. Second step, math. So we did logistic regression, support vector machines, and naive Bayes before. So we'll actually consider all three of those again. And then we can apply any of those here to our extracted bag of words and TF-IDF features. And let's start with logistic regression. I actually can't remember if I do them all or not, probably not, but we could apply all of them here. Well, so taking our log of words, uh, log of words, <laughs> bag of words methods here, we're fitting our training features and training sentiments. Remember sentiment here is positive and negative. And we're predicting them to get our predictions. And let's look at our classification. So our, our text blob, that door is about to get on my nerves. Our text blob component was only able to get 74% accurate. And we only know that because we have a sort of training data set. Okay. The normally when you use some sort of, of uh, lexicon based model, you don't know what it's getting right and wrong. You just hope that it's better than chance. And those um, models have, have, or those models, those people have put together how they think their models are, are good, right? So you can look at any of their documentation to determine um, how well they think they're doing, because they'll tell you. Um, but we knew that it was 74% because we had the answer. And often when you need an unsupervised approach, you don't have the answer. So this is sort of proof of concept of which ones are more accurate in this example anyway. Because remember that every data set can be unique. A lot of these do generalize, but maybe not at the same uh, level every single time. And I, I always tell students that the answer to the which model's best or which extraction's best is, I don't know, try them all. It depends. Okay. But on the same data, predicting um, movie reviews, very classic example, the logistic regression with a simple count vectorizer bag of words gets us to 91% correct. That's way better than 74. It's not just like a little bit better. That's a lot of bit better. Okay. Now, if I do that same thing with TF-IDF, I don't actually get any improvement by normalizing the matrix. So what we see is this is about 90%. So our bag of words system with logistic regression is very good. Now, I could do more with word to vec okay? We could apply this idea into a deep learning system, although I'll argue that that level of complexity, while very popular and people really like it, may not be necessary. Okay? I, I, like, I like to write really slow code. Let me tell you that. Because co good code is code that does what you want it to do, what you told it to do, and gives you and gives you an answer, right? So, and it runs is the, is the thing. Um, I am not known for my writing parallel, parallelized or efficiency, but in a system where time is money, like most business situations nowadays, I would not program a deep learning model to predict sentiment because look how far you can get with movie reviews and logistic regression. So you can use these more complex systems, but I would argue that they may be a bit of overkill. And there is some example code from the textbook that I use for this course, looking at supervised sentiment analysis with the deep learning and with more complex models. I bet though, if I just sat down and tried naive base, also tried sport vector machines, with maybe also word to vec as my feature extraction, I could probably find a model that gets me close to 95% accuracy, okay. which is pretty darn good. Okay. But I want to end this lecture, um, not with running through a whole bunch of classification trials again, because we've certainly learned that better by practicing, but by talking about what I think is missing from many of these machine learning lectures machine learning focuses that a lot of analytics folks have. I'm a scientist, always happen. And so I'm always asking, why does this work? Now there are many scenarios in, a, especially in business that you don't care why it works. It just needs to work until it doesn't work anymore. 
And then you don't know why it doesn't work because you never knew why it worked in the first place. So I always think it's helpful to look at your systems that work, your analytic models, and have some understanding of why. And that to me is really what's missing in many of these, you know, quick uh, learn Python, learn uh, super, super sentiment analysis is that we, we focus so much on the accuracy of the F1 score of our models that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about why. Okay. So why does this work? And it may be kind of hard to get that out of a logistic regression. Now it does give you predictor weights. So we could go in and figure out which words were the most predictive of each classification. And that's really handy. So you can get the log odds values um, or the odds ratio values, depending on your favorite flavor of coefficient for log regression um, and pull those out of the model and see which ones have the highest scores. Cause then we could see which words were doing the most for our prediction and what words were not. And we could just start to build a simpler model maybe of only the words that were useful. But another thing that you can do is actually an unsupervised technique added to your supervised technique. So we've done supervised and unsupervised methods and we know we can predict sentiment. Okay. I can predict it really well. But what, what, what is making that happen, right? What do we know about the text that is getting us that answer basically? Okay. So we could use a confusion matrix to see where we're getting the answer wrong. But in this scenario, when there's positive and negative, the only place to get the answer wrong is the other way. So that's a really helpful matrix to make when you have many classification labels, like we saw in our classification 20 news groups example, but maybe isn't super informative when you only have two. And it doesn't really tell me what the issue with the model was, or why the prediction worked. So we can use some model visualization and interpretation for those who want to understand what a model is doing. Okay. So first step is just look at new predictions and especially useful if they're small predictions. So you can kind of examine when you get it right and when you get it wrong. Getting it wrong is the best way because those are usually the most obvious places that something went awry. And so let's say The Lord of the Rings is an excellent movie. So that one should be positive. I didn't like the recent movie on TV. It was not good and a waste of time. That one should be negative. Okay, just reading them, you, you know which way it goes. If you had to guess which words were most important, probably excellent and not, right? So I created a new corpus. I'm using my clean text function from the previous lecture to, to process the data in the exact same way. This is very important that the data is in the same format every single time. I took my best model, CV transform. Okay. I predicted. And I'm just printing out. There's no classification report here because we're just literally printing to new examples that we haven't really coded. Now, I just spoke aloud what their codes should be, but you know, if you have a hundred of them, <laughs> you would just print it out and see what it looks like. And it works. It matches my perceived answer for those, for those components. Now, the nice thing to me about the logistic regression here is that this predict prabha which why is that what they picked instead of predict prob? Predict probability, predict prob, don't know. It's always amused me. But instead of getting the selected choice, you can actually grab the underlying probabilities of those choices. Okay, this is in scientific notation, so it's a little annoying, but the zero here is negative and the one here is positive. So what we're seeing is that, oops, sorry. What we're seeing is that this has a 0.999 probability of being in the negative group and a corresponding very small 0 0.0008 probability of being in the negative group. Did I say that right? This is positive, this is negative, sorry. Now, this one is so close to zero that it's like pretty much 100% in the negative group and this one's up. 0% in the positive group, they'll always add up to one because that's how logistic regression works. It's the probability of being in group two, okay. Um, or group second, whatever, whatever one is coded second. Okay. 
And so we can use those to find, to me, the most interesting ones from our test data set are the ones where, <laughs> hopefully you can hear Bodhi telling you how much he loves probabilities, um, are the ones where we're at right at 50-50, okay? So finding uh, the probability sets where the data it, or where the predicted outcomes are like 45% yes and 55% no, or the other way around, um, you know, 45% positive, 55% uh, negative, or anything in that range right around 50 are the ones it's most confused about. Those are the ones that are hardest to predict. So extracting those from your finalized model could really tell you something useful. What is it that maybe distinguishes these if I'm getting them right or wrong, that we could add to our model to improve our prediction because we've seen about the ones that the model understands the least. Because the ones on the ends of the distribution, the model understands the most, unless you're getting it wrong. And so you could pull those, the ones you're getting really, really wrong, where it picks, predicts 98% the wrong way as well. So the ends of the distribution are really interesting when you get it wrong, the middle of the probability distribution is really interesting either way, because those are the ones that are difficult to distinguish. Okay. And what you may find is that your model is really accurate, but it's very close to 50-50 every single time. And that's okay, because it's working, but then that will tell you something about the abilities of the model. Okay. So I'm gonna go see what all that barking is about. And we'll pause here and finish up this lecture by adding one more technique to your toolkit where you can um, examine maybe why you're getting the positive and the negatives that you are. All right, turns out we are barking at the walls just for fun. <laughs> the joy of owning beagles. So let's let me tell you how much I love topics modeling as a system that may be informative for understanding the underlying components to your different classification labels. Now, my other course, Anley 540, has way more on topic modeling and our um, newer faculty member, Dr. Jordan, does even more topic modeling than I do. So um, we have other videos if you want to look at, really get in depth on the ins and outs of topic modeling and semantic vector space models. I'm going to give you the brief overview right now. So what does it take to understand representation? So the goals behind topic modeling, while many people talk about it being an unsupervised classification technique, is that the whole point was to really understand what people were doing internally when they were comprehending text. So I have to retrieve concepts from memory to understand what we're talking about. And so I did a lot of, remember we talked about this last week, to help you retrieve the right information that you learned previously. Uh, that in itself is a dynamic process based on the incoming information. So that could change at any minute if I change topics. Okay. And that dynamic process also changes when the word meaning of a when the we, meaning of a word is changed. So we spend a lot of time this semester talking about polysemy, how words have multiple meanings, and sometimes understanding which meaning it should be or word sense disambiguation can be very hard for a computer, but is good easy for us. So topic modeling can hopefully also capture those differences in context because of the words that hang out with. Um, with the target word. Okay, so topic modeling has a similar look and feel to bag of words methods because it is based on bag of words methods. And so we use semantic context, our kind of understanding of the meaning of everything to create this overall gist representation. Gist representation is just the kind of theme or topic that something is about. Now, Pulling the right information from memory can be improved by mentally predicting what concepts are going to be relevant. This is sometimes called expectancy generation, where we're coming up with what we think is coming next. Okay, and that's why surprise twist endings are so much fun, is because it um, goes against our expectations. Okay. 
So for example, bank, which is a very famous example in this literature, may pull up federal and it may pull up reserve because that's about money, checks, money. It could also pull up things like river for river bank. Okay? And considering I live out here on the lake, my bank options come more frequently because I have more experience with that context. So the senses, the different meanings of the word can make um, expectancy generation difficult. Okay, and when you get it wrong, it's really obvious because you'll see people, um, if you watch them read, they'll go back or um, you'll find yourself rereading paragraphs like I missed something here because it's not what I was expecting. So just representation is a cognitive process that really is good for us because it allows us to help disambiguate sense and process information more easily. If you understand what something is supposed to be about, it is easier for you to think about and to read about. And so what topic modeling does is allows us to extract that information computationally and kind of examine the probabilities of different words to create those theme topics. So this is a really great picture. I do believe I stole it from the Griffiths and Stivers article about topic modeling because it represents three different forms of bag of words methods that we've been talking about this whole last three weeks that all have or can be used in an unsupervised system to understand the semantic topic or representation going on. The first one here on the left, A, is a network type model. If you want to learn about all three of these, I have lectures for them from my other class. But very briefly, a semantic network model represents the relationships between words as thinking about this in sort of a, a word or a neural net kind of style where every word is connected to every other word and things that are related because they have shared meaning, they share themes, they share concepts, um, have a higher weight on them. So bank pulls up stream because they're related through river, right? Bank pulls up federal because they're related through money. Uh, the middle one here for B represents a latent semantic analysis, sometimes called latent semantic indexing in an analytics area. But LSA is a system that takes the bag of words method and creates words by dimensions. Words by dimensions represent these underlying, I don't want to call them topics, but underlying themes or things that are going on, these latent um, uh, loose relationships that cause these words to go together. Okay? And if we plot that in low D space, we can start to see the uh, words that group together. So it's not cluster analysis, but it, it shows you how these things go together. And so we see the representation for river, we see the representation for money, and then we also see that maybe there's this third representation for drilling and oil. Now, topic modeling, very similar to LSA, instead takes the bag of words method and turns it into probability distributions of words by topics and documents by topics. So what you end up with is sort of a probability list of how each word relates to the topic, which you give a label. And so we see that bank and money are topic number one. So this is the money representation of bank. Uh, river and stream are topic number two and oil is topic number three by their probabilities. It's never almost that clean, <laughs> but you get the idea. The other cool thing that people use topic modeling for is, is document classification because much like logistic regression, it spits out a probability of each topic. So it tells you how much of each document is that topic which is really nice in a multi-label situation because then I can use those probabilities. So if it has two high probabilities, it's actually both topics because no document is like one thing only. Okay, maybe, maybe tweets are because they're so short. Now these are all vary in their underlying math and their underlying original conceptions. But for our purposes, we can use them to create a visualization, a word, a network of the things that are making the positive reviews positive and the negative reviews negative. Okay. So very briefly, a little bit on the math. This top one is LSA. It takes a words by documents matrix. That's our count vectorizer. It transforms that using latent, no, 
singular vector decomposition, sorry, I almost said the wrong one, SVD, and crunches that to words by dimensions. Remember that dimensions, this is a dimension reduction technique here. Dimensions are the like representations of, of theme, of semantic space. Okay? And so and it gives us a weight now of how each word is related to some sort of theme. And we can also see how each document is related to those themes, but most people spend their time and efforts focusing on words by dimensions because the, the words that go together tell you what those dimensions mean. Okay. Now in a topic model, instead of the count vectorizer um, and singular vector decomposition, what we can take is that count vectorizer and then turn it into a probability distribution. So it's the probability of each word in each document, okay, controlling for, it's a kind of conditional probability distribution. Um, we apply latent direct elect analysis or LDA, since I can't say the stupid word, um, to that to crunch the matrix. And what we end up with is words by topics. So we can figure out what each topic means and topics by documents, which is also very popular to use in a classification scenario. But we're not classifying here. So we're gonna focus on words by topics, okay? And so we use topics modeling here to help us understand what's in the text. And I'll talk to you about the dangers of doing this as well. So I'm gonna do this as kind of a bad example on purpose. Okay. It's a good visualization technique generation to know what's in the text rather than just the prediction of the text. Because my main goal here is what can I do with my finalized model to understand what is happening? We already talked about the probabilities, with a brief dog howling break, and now we're looking at topic modeling. It can also be used as a uh, unsupervised classification technique, although I will tell you that I do think because text is so complex and topic modeling tends to capture more of those complexities, uh, it would not be very good for sentiment analysis because uh, narrowing everything down to two topics when you're talking about movies will capture a lot of noise and won't capture you can't force the topic to be positive or negative, if you will. There are newer models called seeded topic models that you may be able to get to work, but something like text blob is actually gonna be more effective. All right, so we're gonna load pi LDA viz to create visualizations of our topic model. And using the newer version of Gensum, be sure you load pi LDA viz .gensum models as well. You ignore my matplotlib error that's happening on my work machine because it's mad about something and we'll also load Gensum. Okay, we use Gensum for words of X, so a lot of this is gonna look familiar because Gensum's modeling system is very cleanly organized and many of them have the same arguments on purpose. Okay. Now to do this, because we have the answer, we're gonna separate reviews into positive reviews and negative reviews, because if you throw everything in together and tell it, give me two topics, it'll be way super messy and you won't really see that positive negative split very well. Um, so instead we're gonna make two separate data sets, positives and negatives, and see if we can get something out of that. And it's tempting to do them all and just pick two topics, but um, every review of these movies is gonna have a lot of stuff going on. There's gonna be a lot of themes, a lot of different topics happening at once. So doing it this way will at least allow us to think about these globally. Okay. Now I'm going to take my data set and I'm gonna say, okay, data set where the sentiment column equals positive. I only grab the first thousand because um, time and effort here, but normally you do it on all of them. Let me grab where the data set is negative. Okay, and I took um, the second thousand. On both of these, I applied NLTK's word tokenize because one um, thing that's important for topic for working with Gensum is that it does require tokenized data sets. Okay. Many of our other functions do not, like T, uh, the count vectorizer, and the TFIDF vectorizer, but Gensum wants it to be tokenized. <clears throat> All right, now this hopefully will be vaguely familiar because we've done some of this using the word to vec version of Gensum or um, function in Gensum. So we'll do corpora.dictionary on a positive reviews, corpora.dictionary on negative reviews. 
unsurprisingly, this makes us a vocabulary of words we're looking for. And then <clears throat> we're gonna actually create a cal vectorizer matrix, right? So dictionary positive dot doc to bow. This takes documents to bag of words for every document in our positive reviews, for every document in negative reviews. Now we've got our documents by term matrix or term by document matrix. It doesn't really matter, but this system sets it up as the bag of words method. Okay. And so you'll see that that's, this is very popular feature extraction, no matter kind of where we're predicting. All right, now to run this, it's uh, gensum.models.lda model.lda model. Just like word to vec is like very deep, gensum.models.word2vec. If you wanted to do LSA instead of topic modeling, it's LSI model. And so I like this package because they're very similar. It allows me to teach like five or six of these models and talk about their differences without too many code changes. Corpus here, you put in your term document matrix. ID to word, you put in your dictionary. This just matches the, the column name. It's kind of like column names, essentially telling it what um, each vocabulary word is. Your number of topics. Now there are a lot of ways to think about number of topics, but since we're just exploring the data, start with them, um, you know, like five to 10, because topics that don't matter won't show up. And so you can always lower it, right, or go up. But generally this is a data reduction technique. So you don't tend to go very large. Okay. Random state, didn't use 42 this time. Update every word, chunk size 100, 10 passes. These are kind of common defaults. This bad boy here has this whole system on its own. I'll leave that for my other lecture, but there are ways to calculate this sort of like entropy system where you can think about, um, compare models and see which one has a kind of better fit. Um, you can compare alphas between models. This one calculates alpha based on the model. There are ways to just have a fixed alpha. They don't tend to work as well. Okay, so we're gonna do that same thing for the negative one. So all I've done here is change which corpus I'm using. All right. Now, unfortunately, um, there's some really great examples on how to do this in R as well in my topics lecture. If you're more of an R person, the uh, topic modeling package is really great. And then Julia Silge and her tidy text mining book has a really um, beautiful set of examples of how to do this in R in pretty ways. So she has some really great um, GG plot pictures. But if I'm going straight from Gensum, I can actually tell it to print the formula for me. It tells me the beta weight for each word. Okay. So the first topic here, the most strongly related word to that topic is extra. Morgan, vote, cousin, discussion, intention, fabulous, liberal. And so we can go through it this way. But this can be quite hard to read. Okay. You could also take this and use it in your favorite matplotlib. In the negative models, we've got fell, which makes sense. That's not a positive word. Canyon, ants, but notice that these values are very small. And that's not unusual. Now, let me tell you something better. Okay, one reason I love this is because there's an add-on package called PyLDAViz that allows you to make this uh, external HTML file that will visualize all this stuff for you and make it a little easier for you to interpret. Okay, and this is how you do it. PyLDAViz.GensumModels. If you're using the old version, version of Gensum, it's just .gensum. But we are using all the updated versions. So it's gensum underscore models dot prepare. Um, you put in the model, the uh, term by document matrix, the ID to word, and leave in jobs as one, especially if you're on a Windows machine. If you up this number on a Windows machine, I've never gotten it to work, just FYI. Okay. And I've never changed it back. So I don't know if it works now, but it used to never work. Okay. Now let's go over and look at um, that file. So I'm gonna have to figure out where I put that file because it's not here in Zoom. <laughs> All right. So I think it's under GitHub, 520 lectures. I'm a, a files and folders and files person. Here they are. So let's open what those outputs look like. Okay. 
which one did we get first? All right, so here's the positive one. On the left side here, what we get is a sort of PCA representation, a low D two-dimensional space using multidimensional scaling, okay, to draw a picture of where each topic is in relation to each other in space. And so like I said, when if you have too many topics that just don't show up, well, here's topic one is very strong. Here's topic two, maybe there's three topics, but here's the rest and they don't, they're not very big. So I'd probably say that the positive reviews generally fall under three big topics. It also gives you the um, basically variance accounted for down here. When you click on a specific topic, you'll notice that it's changing over here. And this here is the um, words that are strongly, most strongly related to that topic. Okay. And if they're in red here, that implies that they are the most strongly related and they have many tokens. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna click on one here. And I did the, it's very small. I know I don't think I can make it, oh, I can, a little bit bigger here. Um, I did this wrong on purpose. So when we screened our data at the beginning of the lecture, we left in all the punctuation because punctuation can be informative for sentiment analysis, especially exclamation points. Could go either way though, right? And so topic modeling, don't do that. Really don't do that. Because what we see here is there's a lot of, of punctuation that comes up as per, you know, a useful topic. And it's really not. Like the commas are not informative for what a topic is. But if I ignore that, first thing I see in the positive one is the word not. So the opposite of, right? But then we got movie, one, film, I really like, okay, really like makes some sense here. Character, funny, men, women, love. Okay, so now I can kind of see what some of the most predictive words would be for the pop positive text. Let's look at topic two here. Brothers, episode, husband, recently. Uh, we can start to see numbers, Danny Williams. So we're starting to see what, what types of movies people like. Fantasy, right? And then if I look down here at three, Sean Connery movies, hero, hot villain, <laughs> villain, uh, sexism, operation. So, you know, there are words here that I would consider negative connotations, but they may be very predictive for the positive um, positive reviews uh, in, in the sense of um, uh, you're not, you can't control what is predictive or not, right? I can't make it where every review that has six knots in it is negative. Sometimes that's just the way people write. Now let's look at the other one here. Here's our negative visualization. And it has the same basic pattern, one, two, three. Well, two is a little smaller, I think. Our most predictive word, our most common topics in the negative review, who well, looks very similar, right? Not movie, but one film, really like character, love. So maybe those words are not distinguishing because they're on both sides. Okay. Under two here, what we see is very similar ones. So much that I often wonder that like, did I print these right? But I'm pretty sure they're right. <laughs> And then for three, we get the same kinds of issues. Okay. So I'll go back and make sure that these are correct posted on GitHub. But if both of them turn out exactly the same, then you don't, you still don't maybe know what is predictive. Now we'll say that I think the, the point here is that punctuation is really problematic. You should take it out. And it may be that what is predicting under the hood is not words that you would expect. So in this scenario, you know, with these kinds of results, I just also want to really show off how cool this um, visualization technique is and hope that it gives you better, different answers for each category. Um, but if that were to happen, I would go back to my, to my log and extract my coefficients and look at the large, like sort them and pick the largest coefficients and see what I could see, right? So one of set of very high positive coefficients will predict one, uh, the positive category and the high set of negative coefficients to predict the negative category and I could get a feel for what words are actually doing the prediction. The topic modeling does some really great work for me at um, telling me what those underlying topics might be. 
And in this scenario, it's not giving us uh, anything super useful, except what we're seeing is that topic one here seems to be the like adjectives about the words, right? It's the film is funny. There's a lot of characters. There's men and women. Love is very um, indis nondescript. It's not a specific movie, right? But then once we get into starting to get into topic two, you can start to see which movies and what types of movies people are liking or disliking. Right. So let's end, right? I'm just gonna make sure LDA negative. Okay, so I did print them correctly. <laughs> um, uh, they just look very similar. Okay. So let's take a summary here. We've learned how to use those pre-built lexicons to predict the polarity of text and they work pretty well. They're not the best of models, but they could be useful for quick and efficient classification. We, and then you could also work using ROC or sensitivity kinds of analyses to make those even better. I didn't really try very hard and we still got 74-ish percent correct. Okay. Then we use supervised techniques to build our own sentiment classifiers. We did a lot better and I still didn't try very hard. So if you have a data set that is similar to the types of things you're trying to predict, definitely go supervised techniques. But sometimes you may have a problem, a new problem that you don't have a similar enough data set to work with. Okay. And remember, you can extend that to any type of feature input and machine learning algorithm. So you could find that word to vec works better for you than simple bag of words. But I, um, I think the classification lecture showed that it will depend on the data, uh, the match of the data to your training data. And I would just try a bunch of them and see what works best and then tune the best one until you got it real good. Okay. And then we extended on how we might visualize these, thinking about either the, the information that's actually stored in the algorithm you pick, all of them will have some sort of coefficient that tells you which predictors are the most important and or the probabilities of the outcome that I could use to examine um, which ones I'm getting really, really, really wrong. So it's predicting it completely in the wrong direction or ones where it's a gray area where I'm getting it right or getting it wrong, but it's really close to that 50-50 cutoff or whatever the, um, for the prediction. So we can pull those uh, results out. And then we ended on topic modeling, thinking about how we might use some visualization. So what may work even better for me on these topic pictures, other than cleaning out the punctuation because it causes problems in the model, is grabbing the uh, logistic regression probabilities that were like 100% positive. They were super positive. My most positive reviews and only looking at those because I picked a random subset of the data. I could pick the ones that are most representative of positive that my algorithm is getting the most right and then see what's uh, uh, available in the data set. So you'd look at those predict probas and grab the, the sort them and grab the top 100, for example. And that may give you some good, better visualizations, uh, also remove the punctuation. So thanks for attending this course and um, being with us this whole time. This is the end of our sentiment lecture and correspondingly the end of this class. So go work on your final portfolio. And I'm grateful that you have made it through with me.